Um, so, thank you everyone for uh, coming out. It's a beautiful day for the Veg Fest. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking not just about the wonderful food that we're enjoying here, but how eating well, eating more of a vegan, plant-based lifestyle can favorably impact your health. This talk was originally about an hour talk, so I'm going to move through some of the slides quickly, but I'm happy to hang around uh, afterwards if anyone has any questions. I also have some pamphlets over here. Um, I, I, you see this uh, vibrant bead and green bead here. I'm actually starting up a healthy lifestyle center that's supposed to open up in May to June, and there's some information over here. So if you wanted to grab a pamphlet, they're on the table. So, all right. So one of my passions uh, has always been cooking, food, fitness, and. Having been in town as a cardiologist for about a decade, uh, five years ago or so, I really became, became frustrated with seeing a lot of the chronic disease and many of the patients I was seeing just not getting better. So we had them on more and more medications, they were getting heavier, more difficult to control problems like diabetes, high blood pressure, and that's when I turned to researching more about the role of food uh, in treating chronic disease. and. Just in the last couple of years, I've also started to get involved with American College of Lifestyle Medicine, where they talk about not only the food, but also the mental health aspect, the sleep aspect, the emotional wellness. And uh, this past October, I actually got certified, uh, board certified by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So that's, that's the approach that I'm going to take when I'm talking about lifestyle and chronic disease. Uh, here are some pictures. Um, I, as I mentioned, I've always enjoyed cooking. Uh, up in the top here, I was on a ski trip with a bunch of uh, good friends and we, were, we prepared a bunch of plant-based meals. Uh, my wife and I uh, did a cooking uh, program for the American Heart Association and we also had the opportunity to go up to University of Florida where we, we both graduated from and do a plant-based cooking demonstration with the med students and faculty. And here's just a, a sample of uh, some of the, the fitness things I'd like to participate in as well. All right, so why is this important? Why is lifestyle medicine so important? Uh, as you know, uh, in our country, obesity is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, more than 30% of, of people in our country are obese, and that number is anticipated to be about 50% by 2050. Uh, we also have about a third of the population that's overweight. So what are some of the things that we see in the primary care setting, the things that we see in addition to obesity and in part caused by being obese and overweight, these are the most common. 80% of what we see in the primary care setting are things like hypertension, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis. And these are all lifestyle related conditions. But despite these being lifestyle related conditions, you very rarely hear physicians talking to patients about a healthier lifestyle. And the top leading, uh, ten, uh, of the 10 top leading cause of death, many of these are lifestyle related as well. So heart disease and cancer are number one and two killers. And that, I'm gonna have a focus on heart disease and cancer because as you can see, they account for almost two thirds of the death in our country. But other common lifestyle related diseases are strokes, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. And just to uh, reinforce this point, there were a couple of studies done looking at heart attacks and strokes uh, throughout the world. So this study looked at uh, 52 countries and there's one that looked at strokes that was over 30 countries. And they really found that the major risk factors, because many people come to me and they say, well, you know, I can't fight my genes. My genes are my destiny. But that's not really the truth. Uh, the genes certainly influence things, but we have an opportunity to influence our genetics as well. So what these studies basically showed that was many of the risk factors, about 90% of the risk of having a heart attack and having a stroke, are related to lifestyle factors. Things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, lack of physical activity, not eating a heart healthy plant based diet. So these are things that we can influence. And the same goes for cancer. So if you look at these top causes of death, heart disease, stroke, cancer, we can see that they're all heavily lifestyle influenced. And if you look at these, these four lifestyle factors in particular, these are going to come up over and over again. Obesity, lack of physical activity, uh, poor diet, and tobacco use. So just by changing these things alone, we can significantly influence rates of heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Just 
just skipping through this one. So lifestyle medicine. So what is lifestyle medicine in addition to plant-based diet? That's what we're gonna focus on mostly today is, is the, the dietary aspect, uh, but also includes things like physical activity, uh, encouraging that, encouraging emotional wellness, uh, meditation, mindfulness, making sure people are getting enough sleep, counseling on tobacco and alcohol. And when we talk about the nutrition with lifestyle medicine, we're really focusing on a whole foods plant-based diet. So trying to find uh, foods that are minimally processed that don't necessarily have a label attached to them. Uh, with emphasis when I talk to patients, I talk about the pyramid approach. So the bottom of the pyramid should be things like fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds. And then making sure that, especially if people are overweight, that they eat appropriate portion sizes. So what does that mean? That means being mindful of what we're eating. So not just shoveling food in our mouth or watching TV or doing stuff on the computer, but actually taking time to enjoy your food, to chew your food, to be social with others uh, so we don't eat too much. And then also just eating a variety of colorful foods so we maximize uh, the phytochemicals, the micronutrients, the antioxidants. And then also we really like to minimize processed foods, refined grains, refined sugars, oils, things that we consume way too much of in our country that are all associated with chronic disease. All right, so a couple of population studies which really confirm that this is a healthy way of living. So the blue zones, has everyone here heard of the blue zones? If, so most people, so if you haven't, there's probably a blue zone uh, booth here today. But basically the blue zones were uh, different areas of the world that were documented by travel journalist Dr. Uh, Dan Butner. And what, what was common is that these people live long, healthy lives into their 90s and 100s. So they have the largest populations of people living into the 90s and 100s, and they all seem to have some commonalities, which include eating a plant-based diet, and mostly eating local fruits, local vegetables, beans that are, are native to that particular area. And in addition, they just tend to be more active and more social. So they eat dinner together, they socialize together after dinner. Uh, they're active not necessarily doing formal exercise, but just with their day-to-day -day activities. And these areas are in all, all parts of the world, so uh, Costa Rica, Greece, uh, Italy, Japan, these are all native populations, and then there's more of a uh, if you, manufactured population, if you will, with the Seventh-day Adventists out in California, whose religious principles really dictate that they follow some of these principles. Other population evidence, so I took this from the China study. What you can see on this chart is as you go from the left to the right, uh, those, the light bars there are the incidence of heart disease and cancer, and you can see that that declines as consumption of whole food plant-based diet increases, so as the dark bars increase. And the U.S. does pretty poorly there. The, most of the Asian po populations traditionally do a lot better with consuming plant-based diet. They have a much lower incidence of heart disease and stroke. All right, so moving on to some, some of the specific diagnosis. So I'm going to focus on a couple of things here because we said that these lifestyle factors are major contributors to some of the chronic illnesses we see. So this is something called the DASH diet. Uh, this is a landmark study that we oftentimes refer to showing just how well uh, diet can influence things like high blood pressure, one of the most common diagnoses that we see. So if you look at, uh, let's see if I have a laser here. So if you look at the, the uh, uh oh, no, that's not good. No, if I, okay, thank you, Mike. to turn the slideshow back on. What's it? Okay, yeah, it's, it's going up there. I can't quite switch through. Okay, there we go.
Well, I can talk about this while the slides are going, but essentially what the DASH type diet is, is focusing on eating a more plant-based diet. And in the study looked at eating a standard American diet versus a plant-based diet. And it looked at the influence of just switching to a plant-based diet or switching to a plant-based diet and lowering sodium consumption. And what they found was just going from a standard American diet to eating more plant-based foods, we can lower the blood pressure by about eight points. And why is that? So plants have a lot of uh, a lot of benefits in terms of hypertension, meaning that we tend to eat more potassium, we tend to eat more magnesium. Both have been found to help reduce blood pressure. We also eat substances, or they contain substances such as nitrates, which help the blood vessels dilate, which lowers our blood pressure. And then not eating as many foods like the oils and the refined grains, which tends to cause the blood vessels to constrict and raise blood pressure. So by all these mechanisms, a plant-based diet can help lower blood pressure. In addition to switching to just eating more plants, even if we're eating a high sodium diet, if we then say we're gonna reduce the sodium from the average of about 3,500 milligrams a day, which is what Americans tend to eat, down to about 1,000 milligrams, we can lower the blood pressure by about another five points. So you can get about a 12 point reduction in the blood pressure just by switching to eating more plants and trying to watch your sodium intake. And what about cholesterol? So there is a, a uh, study called the Portfolio Study, and uh, David Jenkins, he's a, an author out of Canada, uh, came up with this portfolio diet. So again, switching from a more standard diet to a plant-based diet, but he included foods which he called portfolio foods. And these included things like a measured amount of soy products, uh, nuts, almonds in particular, uh, viscous fiber, so things like oatmeal, eggplant, okra, things that tend to form a gel in our, in our bowel and drag some straw out of our system, and then plant sterols. Uh, plant sterols are components of plant-based foods that help prevent absorption of cholesterol. These are fine to har they're hard to find in large quantities in most plant-based foods, so you'll find that some foods are supplemented with these, and you can also just buy a supplement that is, is higher in plant sterols. Uh, there's one called Cholestop, which is a common one over the counter. So this combination of four things, in addition to eating plant-based diet, was shown to reduce the bad cholesterol by about 30%. And it, it did so without dropping the good cholesterol. So that ratio really stayed about the same. Uh, in the important thing to see here is that the dropping about 30% with just diet was equivalent as a low dose of a statin medication. So I have a lot of patients that come in and say, listen, I, my, my, my cholesterol is a little bit high, but what can I do to avoid getting on cholesterol medication? So I can quote this study and say, well, we can, we can influence your cholesterol pretty significantly by causing a 30% drop, similar to what we'd see with a statin. In addition, if you look at the C-reactive protein, this is a marker of inflammation, and we know that inflammation is the root cause of many of the chronic illnesses we see too. There was about a 30% reduction in the C-reactive protein uh, in those following the portfolio diet. I'm, I'm flashing up just a bunch of diff different vegan meals that I've prepared, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk about them, but I'm happy to talk about them after if anyone has time. All right, what about cardiovascular disease? So, so I'm a cardiologist, so I see a lot of cardiovascular disease, and, and again, a lot of the cardiovascular disease goes back to some of these other things that we're talking about, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, diabetes. So coronary disease, is basically the buildup of plaque, which you can see here. This is a cross section of an artery. And if you think of the artery as kind of being uh, like a wall, in the inner, there's several different layers. And then the inner layer is kind of like wallpaper over the wall. I think this is a good analogy. And what happens, what coronary disease develops is this cholesterol plaque starts getting underneath the wallpaper and causing it to bulge out. And so there's actually uh, not necessarily blockage that forms on the innermost part of the vessel, but it forms inside the wall and causes the wall to start moving in. So one of a few things happens over time. Either there's progressive narrowing of the vessel, and eventually a uh, patient might start to have symptoms like chest pain, or this plaque just kind of ruptures right through the wallpaper and the body sees this as an injury, blood starts to clot uh, inside the vessel and people have a heart attack. So really what we want to try to do is, number one, prevent this plaque from forming there in the first place, or for people that already have the beginning of plaque formation, either stabilize or reverse that and certainly help prevent that from turning into a heart attack. And there is evidence 
that doing this with lifestyle measures, we can, we can accomplish all of these goals. So just to go over a couple of the population studies, you'll see me reference this nurse's health study a few times. Uh, so this is a large population study looking at over about 85,000 uh, nurses that have been given surveys and followed for their, their lifestyle habits and their health, uh, their health conditions over a period of about 15 to 20 years. So what did they find in this population study? We're going to see the same theme over and over again. We can significantly lower the risk of coronary disease by about 80% just by making sure people are not smoking, making sure they're not overweight, making sure they exercise at least 30 minutes a day and follow a heart healthy diet. And the, the healthy diet focused on consuming a lot of fiber, healthy omega-3 uh, fatty acids, and folate, which is rich in a lot of plant-based foods. Also, just consuming, for every fruit and vegetable that we consume a day, they found that there's about a 4% reduction in, in uh, cardiovascular disease. So if you eat the recommended you know, 8 to 10 servings of fruit and vegetables a day, that alone causes a significant reduction in the incidence of heart disease. And what about the Mediterranean diet? So there, a lot of people have heard about the Mediterranean diet. We talk about this as being an effective way to, to treat cardiovascular disease. I think that a lot of the olive oil companies have taken a different message and said, you know, well, eat a lot of olive oil, that's great for you. That was the conclusion of the Mediterranean diet. But, but that's not really the truth. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in just a second. But essentially, there are two large studies which look at a Mediterranean diet. The first one is called the Leon Heart Study. And this looked at people that already had a heart disease and had a heart attack. And what they did was they compared a Mediterranean type diet, which is rich in fruits and vegetables, and healthier fats, so healthier fats instead of things like saturated fat instead of refined grains, and they compared that to the standard American Heart Association type diet, which you know, they call this a low-fat diet with being 30% of calories from fat, but truly a low-fat diet would be a little bit less than that. So nonetheless, they looked at different outcomes like dying from heart disease, having recurrent heart attacks, being hospitalized, and what they found was uh, consistently looking at all these outcomes, the Mediterranean diet was far superior to the standard American Heart Association diet in people that have had established heart disease. And then there was a study, more of a preventative study, so people that haven't had heart attacks yet but were at risk for having a heart attack. So this was a study called the Predimed study, and again what they saw was comparing a Mediterranean diet to a to an American Heart Association kind of low-fat diet, there was about a 30% reduction in people developing heart attacks, uh, stroke, or dying from cardiovascular causes. So this was more of a preventative study in people that didn't have established cardiovascular disease. Now, as part of this study, people were given four tablespoons of olive oil every day, and that's where the olive oil companies kind of said, well, listen, olive oil is great for you. But really, the, the I think the message that we should walk away with from here was that people were taking olive oil instead of refined grains, instead of refined sugars, instead of saturated fat. So it was more of a, a substitution, if you will. And if you look at, I think this is a great chart. Uh, this was from this American Heart Association presidential statement. And on the, the top here, uh, what they're looking at is switching for the same amount of calories from saturated fats to an unsaturated fat or monounsaturated fat or to whole grains. So everything, all the colors going to this side show that switching saturated fats to these healthier fats or whole grains are beneficial, which is what we saw in the Mediterranean diet, and switching saturated fats to trans fats or refined carbohydrates is not beneficial. And the bottom graph is the same thing, switching the same amount of calories from refined grains to healthier fats uh, is beneficial to switching refined grains to saturated fats is not helpful. So the message with the Mediterranean diet is not necessarily that olive oil is helpful, but switching to healthier fats from less healthy fats or from refined grains is really where the benefit was along with just consuming more plants. And then there were a couple, so now we're at people that have established coronary disease and we want to see if we can reverse coronary disease. So there were really a few big trials that demonstrated this. One was by Dr. Dean Ornish, who is a pioneer in, in not only plant-based uh, lifestyle, but lifestyle medicine in general. So he looked at putting people through his program, which was really a comprehensive program focused on 
eating plant-based foods, mostly a vegan diet, uh, regular exercise, stress management, tobacco cessation. And what did he find? So he found that if you look at the orange squares here, uh, people started out the study when they had an angiogram with about a 40% blockage and had an 8% reduction. So when they went back in after five years, they found that their coronary disease not only stabilized, but actually reversed. And in, in people that were on the typical American Heart Association type program, they had almost a 30% progression in their blockage. In addition, there are some other benefits. Uh, people tended to lose almost 15 pounds and their bad cholesterol dropped in the range of 20%. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn, another pioneer in the field of plant-based medicine, uh, took 23 patients, so a small trial, but really end-stage vascular disease. These were people that really had no options left in terms of stenting, bypass surgery. They were kind of maxed out on their medications and very symptomatic. So he put them on a very strict plant-based diet, which included no, not even healthier fats or oils. Uh, you could see that this plan cut their cholesterol in half from about an average of about 260 to 130. Uh, again, saw a 7% reduction in their coronary disease and the blockage when they had an angiogram. And I think this bottom statistic is remarkable. So in the years leading up to the study, when these patients were enrolled, there were 49 events, if you will, uh, over eight years. And over the next 11 years after they've been enrolled in this lifestyle program, there was only one event uh, in the 23 people. And then he went on to do another study uh, similar to that done by Dr. Ornish with 200 people. I thought, first of all, it was remarkable that many people don't think that they can stick with a plant-based diet if it's, if it's new to them. But in here, he found that 90% of people were able to adhere to this way of eating. Once again, we see over 15 pound weight loss. In those patients that were adherent, 99% of them plus were free of any coronary events over the next few years. The patients that dropped out, so the 11% that weren't adherent, uh, about two thirds had an event, meaning things like strokes, heart attacks, stents, bypass surgery. So what, how is a whole foods plant-based diet beneficial uh, in people with vascular disease? A lot of mechanisms. So it's not just about eating less fat, eating less cholesterol. One of the major reasons that we tend to develop chronic diseases is with not eating enough fiber, enough nutrients, we don't nourish our microbiome, so the healthy bacteria in our gut. This tends to lead to what they call a leaky gut. So some of the, the toxins that are supposed to, to not make it through the barrier of our colon into our bloodstream start to leak into our bloodstream and our body forms an autoimmune reaction, so it becomes a lot of inflammation, which again is at the root of many of our chronic diseases. So by eating more plant-based foods, we nourish this microbiome and have a much healthier gut and less leaky gut. Additionally, when we eat animal protein, particularly eggs and red meat, uh, we're consuming things like carnitine and choline. Uh, our bacteria in our gut form something called TMAO, uh, from choline and carnitine, and this is felt to be something that's highly atherogenic, so causes inflammation, cholesterol buildup uh, in our vessels. There's actually even a blood test now that you can get your TMAO levels checked. Interestingly, in people that don't eat any meat, in vegans, they don't even have these bacteria. So if you, if you feed meat to someone that's been vegan for a number of years, they won't form this TMAO. Uh, advanced like in end products, so these are products which form when we're cooking meats, particularly also with some plant-based foods such as nuts, but more so with meats and processed meats. If we cook them at high temperatures for prolonged periods of time, especially dry heat, so things like baking for long periods of time, uh, cooking things for a long time on a pan, grilling. Uh, so advanced glycation end products are, are formed to a much lesser degree with things like boiling, broiling, making stews and crock pot, things like that. So these are another thing that are associated not only with inflammation and vascular disease, but have also been found to cause uh, DNA damage and lead to cancer. And then finally, heme iron. So heme iron is the form of iron that uh, we absorb from animal protein versus non-heme iron from plant-based protein. So high levels of this have also been associated with DNA damage and inflammation uh, associated with vascular disease. He's looking for Mike. Make sure I'm okay on time. Okay. All right. So diabetes. 
Um, how many people here think diabetes is related to eating too much sugar? Is that this is this is what I get from most of my patients. So the first thing people say to me is like, I'm, I'm not going to eat the sugar, so I'm not going to have diabetes. Or if they have diabetes, they just try to cut out carbohydrates, which is really not a good idea. So diabetes is is a disease very common in our country. So about 30 million people have diabetes, and almost 100 million people are pre-diabetic. And it's really related to a complex interplay of multiple things. But mostly it starts with being too fat, having too much fat, consuming too much fat. So fat gets deposited in the abdomen, in the muscle, in the liver, in the pancreas. And when we get too much fat in the muscle, we can't get sugar in the muscle. Now that our, our muscles need sugar. They start to build glycogen so they can use this for energy. We get fat in the liver. Uh, this is the most common cause of liver failure in our country today, fatty liver. And then we get fat in the pancreas, which uh, the pancreas is what produces insulin, so suddenly our pancreas isn't working well anymore. And all this extra fat also causes inflammation, and this is part of the process. So there's many contributing factors here, but the answer to fixing diabetes isn't really removing carbohydrates. The reason that people's blood sugars are better when they're not consuming carbohydrates is simply because they're not introducing carbohydrates. And I heard a good analogy, uh, it's like taking a reckless driver off the road. If you have a reckless driver and you take him off the road, he's not going to cause any accidents. But it's not because you made him a good driver, he's just not on the road. So if someone doesn't eat any carbohydrates, their sugars are going to be great. But the moment they introduce any carbohydrates back into their system, their blood sugars are going to shoot through the roof if they continue to eat too much animal protein, too much fat. So just looking at a couple of the studies with diabetes, again, we're gonna look at can we pre prevent diabetes, can we reverse diabetes, just like we looked at with coronary disease. This is that nurse's health study, again, that I referred to, and really the same factors that affected coronary disease affected diabetes. So they found that uh, there was a significant reduction in diabetes for people that weren't overweight, that had healthier diets, high in fiber, high in healthy fats, lower in refined grains, lower in saturated fats, people who exercised for at least 30 minutes a day that were not smokers and that didn't have too much alcohol or too little alcohol. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on these, but only just, I wanted to really show this slide to, to demonstrate that there are a number of studies which show that increased consumption of red meat has a very high association with diabetes. So many of my patients say, well, I'm not eating carbohydrates, but I'm gonna eat a lot of animal protein. Uh, but you can see here from the Nurses Health Study, looking at over 90,000 people, the Adventist Health Study and the EPIC Study, all show that there can be up to a doubling of incidence of diabetes uh, with higher levels of meat consumption. In this EPIC Study, which was a population study in Europe, shows that for every 5% of calories from meat, there's a 30% increase in diabetes. The Diabetes pre Prevention Program, so this was one of these can we prevent diabetes from forming in people that already have prediabetes? And as I mentioned, there's about 100,000 people in our country that have prediabetes. So this study looked at just not necessarily focusing on a plant-based diet, but just focusing on a healthier diet, exercising regularly, trying to lose some weight versus the standard care, which is telling your patients, we'll just follow you know, a low-carb American Diabetes Association diet, and we'll also add metformin, which is the most common diabetes drug. Uh, or just doing the standard recommendations without any medications. And what they found, if you look at the green line on the bottom, just trying to do the lifestyle, the regular exercise, healthy diet versus the placebo led to a 60% reduction in people developing diabetes. And there was even a 30% reduction compared to medication, which is metformin. And uh, for anyone that is diabetic or pre-diabetic or has family members that are diabetic, this is a great book to read. Dr. Neil Barnard did a study where he, he took um, about 100 patients and divided them. So these were people that had diabetes. He was trying to see if we could reverse it, divide them into a vegan group versus traditional American Diabetic Association diet recommendations. And what did he find? In the vegan group compared to the ADA group, there was a 48% 48, 48 of these patients were able to reduce their diabetes medications versus in the standard group, only 23%. The hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of average blood sugars over the previous three months, dropped three times as much in the vegan group versus the uh, standard group. And weight loss and cholesterol 
uh, both dropped about twice as much. And finally, uh, one other study looking at diabetes reversal. So this was patients that had diabetes. So putting people on a, a focused weight loss um, program through regular exercise and diet. And again, this one didn't focus so much on plant-based diet, but it was providing patients with a specific, specific guidance, specific foods, and transitioning them into where they learn to eat better on their own. They found that that compared to the standard recommendations, about 50% of people were able to reverse their diabetes uh, over the course of a year, whereas in the standard American Diabetic Association diet, it was only 2%. And what this chart also shows, the more weight people lost, so if they lost more than 15 kilograms, so about 30 pounds, uh, almost 90% of them were able to reduce diabetes. So that shows how much influence there is with weight and diabetes. All right, and then the last few slides are gonna be on cancer. I'm gonna focus on prostate and breast cancer. So there's great data out there on prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, colon cancer, uh, with lifestyle and, and the ability to prevent and reverse some of these problems. I'm gonna skip through this right now. Okay, so two trials with prostate cancer. Uh, there was one by Dr. Ornish, who if you recall also did a comprehensive lifestyle trial to show that we can reverse cardiovascular disease. This was a study of just under 100 men who had low-grade prostate cancer. He implemented his comprehensive lifestyle program uh, versus standard care. Uh, and found, so this one included a, a vegan diet, included soy, so soy is always very controversial when we talk about, talk about cancer, uh, regular uh, exercise, stress management, and inclusion of omega-3 fatty acids. So what did he find? In people that were in his lifestyle program, the PSA levels dropped uh, about 6%, and in the standard, the standard uh, diet, it went up a little bit, about 4%. Excuse me, I mixed those two up. PSA dropped 4% in his group and went up 6% in the standard group. And when you looked at, at drawing blood from these patients and seeing the, how, much they, how much they affected prostate cancer cells in a Petri dish, you saw that the, the blood from people that were in his group was much more effective in reducing uh, prostate cancer cell growth by about 70% versus only 10%. And he also demonstrated that we were able to turn off genes that cause prostate cancer. So if you look at the, the color red over here, switched to, to green, he, they looked at 500 genes basically and found that they were able to turn some off and turn some on. So they turned off genes that promoted prostate cancer and turned on ones that helped reverse prostate cancer. So that's something called epigenetics where we know that lifestyle can affect our genes. So we always like to use the term that genes are not our destiny. <clears throat> and then finally, breast cancer. So going back to the, the soy, there's a lot of confusion regarding soy and breast cancer, soy and prostate cancer. So I just wanted to put up here three, three different large studies that were done looking at soy consumption and reducing mortality in breast cancer and reducing recurrence. So all of these studies showed somewhere between 30 and 50% reduction in mortality in women that had breast cancer uh, and also reduced recurrence rate by up to 30 percent. <clears throat> and these are some of the mechanisms of action uh, that food can reduce cancer. So it re reduces things like insulin as we already talked about, insulin like growth factors, uh, the antioxidant effects, turning off the genes, and then even the anti-estrogen effect of soy. Excuse me. So if anyone wants to talk about these more, I'm happy to talk after. I'll just stand over in the corner over here. And then uh, the last slide I'm gonna show is just, we talked about this at the very beginning, really trying to eat foods across the color spectrum because they all have different antioxidants, phytonutrients. Um, so I think I'm at the end of my time here, but again, I will step aside so anyone that has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer further.